Welcome to Travel Stories by Winnie Travels. Hello to everyone listening on YouTube, Spotify, or Apple Podcasts. We are your hosts. I'm Will. And I'm Kati. In today's episode, we're going to detail our experience of crossing the land border from Albania to Montenegro, and then our entire trip around Bulgarista. So first we start on how much more difficult it was to cross the border uh, than it could have been. So we were in Tirana and then we went to Skodra. And from there, I'm sure there was uh, a lot more options for buses to go uh, and cross the border to the country to the north. But we were not in one of the major cities. We were in a smaller destination, Koplik. Uh, want to give a brief explanation of why we were there? Yeah, so we went to Koplik, which is a small little town about 30 minutes north of Škodra, and we went there in search of a tattoo artist out of a bunker, which we did find, and we'll have a YouTube video about that, so you can go check that out. But because we were going from a smaller city, it was a lot more difficult to try and find transportation to cross the border. Yeah, there was an area where there were some buses, but they were all going the opposite direction, going south when we wanted to go north. We did find one bus and um, there was this old man outside of it with some kind of, I don't know, huge cart kind of situation. Yeah. And he's like, oh, you want to go to Bogorinsa? Like, come this way. And then we followed him. Uh, we have all of our stuff with us. So these huge backpacks. And he's like, speed walking like I've never seen anyone speed walk before. This guy is obviously going to live to 150 years old uh, with the kind of shape that he's in. Yeah. But he got up to the next bus and then... Um, Dropped he, his cart, his little wagon, yeah. and then just walked away. And we're like, okay, I don't think we were supposed to be following him. <laughs> no, so he had no interest of showing us where to go. So no. we kept walking um, until we got to the main road. And our thought was that uh, you know this is the main road no matter whether you're coming from Tirana or Skodra to get to Montenegro and at some point a bus or a taxi or something had to come by plus it tied in with your strong desire for some reason to hitchhike. Yeah I had read in a blog that you know it was easy to hitchhike in Albania and if you just needed a ride go ahead and just hitchhike on the side of the road somebody will pick you up and take you where you need to go. Not in our case. <laughs> no, I mean, we we didn't really, we didn't see any taxis. Um, and as far as buses, uh, we saw like a, a tour bus that um, I guess was already booked. We also saw uh, a lot of people just driving by, which mm -hmm. no one seemed interested in like stopping, except for... there. Well, there was one car that slowed down and honked and looked like, okay, maybe he was going to ask us where we're going and if we needed a ride, but Will started walking towards the car and then he just left. So that was really confusing. Yeah, that was confusing. <laughs> and then another gentleman stopped and he wanted to buy us lunch at the gas station that we were sitting next to. And we're like, no, it's okay. We already ate breakfast. And he's like, no, 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 just come. You can leave your bags there. Don't worry. And we're like, no, we really don't need lunch. But if you want to take us to Podgorica, that'd be awesome. No. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, another old, older gentleman stopped uh, who was on a bike, and we're clearly trying to figure out how we can get a ride there. We're clearly in the middle of doing something. He knew English pretty well. Yeah. He went to America, somewhere in Florida, to get heart surgery. Mm -hmm. um, and we're like, okay, cool. So maybe this guy can help. So the guy who stopped and offered to buy us lunch and wants us to leave our bags there so that probably his friend could come and steal everything that we own in the entire world. Um, you know, I thought that the old man would be a good translator. He was not helpful at all. Mm -hmm. And then another guy stopped, um, I guess, rolled down his window, talked to the old guy a little bit. And, um, you know, eventually uh, he loaded the old man's bicycle up, not very easily because it wasn't in a big truck or anything like that, into like his trunk area of like a car. And then the, the old guy got in. He's like, you know, Bless you, all the best, and this. And then they continued up the road. So basically, this guy was like seeing all the nice, all these nice things, <laughs> uh, but he had an opportunity to say, "Hey, can you guys give these guys a ride?" No, nope, they yeah. just continued on without it. Yeah. So um, I have a feeling he just wasn't all there. I don't know. He was talking some crazy talk. Um, so we'll just give him the benefit of 
the doubt. Because like I said, everybody else in Albania has been super awesome, super helpful. Um, I mean, granted, this was the first time we tried to like catch a ride from a stranger, but um, anyways. Yeah, I mean, when we're traveling, we basically have to go off of, hey, what happened last time or what are the things that we've experienced? So we've seen that there were, were a lot of buses that, you know, are stopping and not just at major bus stops, like anywhere along the way. Um, on our ride from Skodra to Koplik, uh, you know, we went to this bus area, you know, they loaded it up and as they would drive by people, they pick them up, uh, no problem. Also, the bus from uh, Skodra to Koplik was what, like a hundred lek per person? Yeah. So 200 lek. We did see one bus that we were able to flag down that it was pretty packed. I don't know how they'd have room for anyone, but they wanted um, a thousand leg, and we didn't have that much on us. All combined, we had about maybe like 900 or something like that. And the bus was already packed, and it wasn't like we're at a bus stop. So in our mind, it's like we're literally not going very far to mm -hmm. the border. Was probably really only 20 minutes, yeah. and then it'd be like a full 45 minutes to take us to the city. Oh, and that was the other thing too. Like we asked, "Can you take us to Podgorica?" And they're like, "No, no, no, no. We will only take you to the border." And um, we're like, "No, it's okay. We don't have you know a thousand leg." And on top of that, he's like, "No, but like nobody's gonna take you across the border. Like we'll you basically, you know, he was trying to explain it, but yeah, basically we weren't gonna be able to get through the border on a bus." So, I don't know. But we, we were like, hey, just go, you know, head on and we're like, we'll flag down another bus and see if they say the same thing. Yeah, so we actually uh, witnessed him coming back, basically honking oh, yeah. and mocking us, which was not very nice. But then we found another bus that was similar to that. Uh, it did not have that many people in it. And we didn't have the thousand lek um, because we were like, or even if it's double the amount that it was to go a similar distance, it would be a total of 400 lek and then, you know, we, I think we had like a total of like 900. Uh, but there was this lady that was a little bit more helpful. Uh, she wasn't the bus driver, but she was like communicating some things to us. Uh, basically gave them everything I had uh, <laughs> left um, base, uh, to get to the border. Like, okay, well, at least if we get to the border then we can probably figure out um, a way to go on the next, uh, to get across somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, but just standing there on the side of the highway wasn't getting us anywhere and no one was stopping to allow us to get a ride and there wasn't like a public bus like we took to get to Copelik in the first place. So we got into that uh, bus, we had a crossover, like a huge bag of what, peanuts? That was- Oh yeah. Uh, it had something on the ground, you know, Like three uh, feet, foot long bag of uh, peanuts that this guy had eventually dropped that guy off and, um, you know, continued on, drove extremely fast. Um, you know, he was definitely going to get us there in no time at all. And, uh, anything else really memorable happened on that? No. No. So he dropped. Oh him. yes, actually. I think they, again, you know, they didn't know oh, English, yeah. but I think they tried to ask us if like we had just gotten out of jail or something. I'm not sure. All I understood her was say was like policia, like, are you running from the police? Did you just come out of jail? I don't know. And they did like a handcuffs <laughs> uh, symbol with their, their wrists together. I don't know. It was like, maybe it seemed like we were, but we had like all of our stuff. Yeah. So it wasn't like. We had backpacks. Like, I don't think you'd walk out of jail with a bunch of backpacks. No, we weren't in like prison outfits or anything like that. So I guess maybe we thought we were just trying to flee the country. Um, yeah, I don't know. That was really funny though. Yeah. <laughs> so they dropped it. So they, the, the bus driver dropped us off really right at the border where we could see the border crossing and the cars lining up. Um, and we got out and then to our left, uh, there was, I think two taxi drivers, mm -hmm. um, and they said that they would take us to Pokerisa for 20 euros, which, uh, thank God, uh, one of our friends gave us, um, hundred euros, uh, for our wedding gift, which helped. Uh, yeah, you know. we had, yeah. So we had that already with us and we're like, okay, yes, we can do that. <laughs> we don't have any more luck, but we do have euros. Yeah. We, and, yeah. Which is good because I think that, um, you know, Montenegro, we knew that they, they took mm -hmm. euros, so we, we already had some on us. The guy had changed, so he was going to give us $20. I told Kasi to make sure to hold on to the car door because we had to load everything into his trunk. And I was like, at least if he drives away, we can like be in the car. I don't know. Always <laughs> uh, assuming the worst thing is going to happen. But we gave him the $20 and we went through the first uh, crossing point where the, the, you know, the driver... We gave the driver our passports. He showed it to the first guard. 
no problem. And then we start driving to the second one. I think that's where we saw a bunch of like wild, like what sheep or goats? Goats, yeah. Goats in the road. <laughs> in the road. So we navigate through the goats and we get to the second stop. And then at this one, we, we have a, a border guy who actually starts to talk to us. Um, this border um, officer getting into Montenegro was not very friendly and he was asking us a lot of questions like where did you come from all this kind of stuff how long were you there why is he asking us all these questions and then um and then we pull off to the side i don't think they grabbed our bags out of the trunk and started looking through them or anything like that mm-hmm. right they did pop open the trunk they talked to the the driver and uh, we weren't there too long maybe like 15 minutes or something yeah. like that and then you know they gave the um the border patrol gave our taxi driver back our passports and we continued on but the reason why he's probably giving us such a hard time was when we did get to our location later on in the day, we looked at our passports and noticed that we never got a stamp mm-hmm. going into Albania. So looking just at our passports, you would not know that we were in Albania. I understand. We could not have magically appeared in Albania, <laughs> drove across, but they didn't stamp us coming in. So he had a lot of questions and you don't get stamped coming out of America. So we went. According to our passport, we went from America, somehow uh, we're lost in the Bermuda Triangle or something like that, <laughs> and arrived at the Albanian-Montenegrin border. So. Yeah. But yeah. Um, I guess we, we paid a bunch of $10 so the, da- the taxi guy can give it to the Border Patrol, and we were at the, the bus stop there. Um, so it wasn't too terrible. If we were on a bigger bus, uh, we were doing some research that it could be up to like you know 40 30 to 45 minutes to be there. It was just the two of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that big of a deal. Uh, we did get in. It could have been a worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, it only cost us the $20 to the taxi man and the $10 to the policeman. Um, so that worked out okay. Uh, not what we wanted to do, but it, it got us uh, across uh, not too shabby. So after all that, we're at the bus stop. And then we begin our walk to uh, our hotel room for uh, our stay here. So. We're in Pocoresa, the capital of Montenegro, and there was a couple of things that we noticed that we wanted to check out uh, in our time here. One thing is they claim to have, um, well, first of all, it, it's, it's very difficult. We don't want to offend anyone, but one of the reports that we read was about how like uh, Pocoresa was one of the most boring uh, capitals in all of Europe. And I get some people say it's like the Balkan area. I'm just... It's just an article that, that I read and some people, other people did their YouTube videos on, is this the most boring capital in Europe? But I think it's just because people don't look at the history mm-hmm. and everything that this city in particular went through, even though most of the Balkans did go through a lot of terrible things. So in this podcast, we're going to talk about some of the, the major uh, monuments. We're going to talk about major landmarks uh, that kind of correlate with the history of the city. Mm-hmm. And then we're also going to talk about some of the newer, more, more recent things. But one of the things that we saw was, um, you know, they have the Niagara Falls of Montenegro, which we will talk about towards the end of our podcast. Um, They also have, you know, a lot of uh, newer buildings and and landmarks, such as the Millennium Bridge and such as um, the the Church of uh, the Resurrection of Christ. And they even have a Yugoslav era aircraft hangar, um, which is now a winery which we'll also uh, talk about our experience trying to get that situated and uh, try to get onto a a wine tour uh, inside of that building as well. But first, we'll take you way back. Um, There were were some ruins here uh, outside of the city. Uh, Ducle, I believe, used to be the old capital of Montenegro, and this is where there are some 2,000-year-old ruins from the time that Duclea was one of the major cities, was the capital, and was also uh, under the rule of the Roman Empire. So you'll see a lot of Roman influence in these ruins, mm-hmm. and um, it, it's pretty cool. Like it's not as maybe preserved as some of the things that you'll see in um, maybe Greece or maybe around Rome. Uh, together, we have not been there and been to these these ruins, but just looking at you know pictures online and. Um, but this is, as far as like land mass, there is a lot there. So you, you walk in, and what was it? Maybe like an hour walk, or was it more than that from the city of Portland? I think there was about an hour, yeah. About an hour walk out there. I believe it was to the northeast of the city. 
and we stumbled upon one area of ruins and it was like this seems extremely like small like it was just like all rubble, rubble. and things like that mm -hmm. and we saw people well there's a lot unfortunately like a lot of glass bottles and we saw some people kind of i don't know how to barbecue or just like hanging out and drinking mm -hmm. um so i was like i don't really know about this and um because there wasn't a whole lot like really there. I was like, I could have swore I saw like some things with some like Roman etchings and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so we kind of wandered uh, a little bit further and then we saw more of a proper area. Now this area was actually gated in, but you could have sworn that you were in a playground uh, instead of like, you know, ruins. So, you know, it's a good and bad thing. You'll have to pay an entry fee to go to some ruins. This mm -hmm. doesn't have an entry fee, doesn't have a guard, doesn't have security to kind of say, hey, this is a historical landmark, mm -hmm. kind of respect it. So, I mean, what did you think about uh, being at the, the ruins? Yeah, it's definitely, you know, different than the ruins that we've seen, um, you know, and all the historical sites that we've seen so far in the rest of Albania. And uh, it, like you said, it literally felt like a playground. There was families scattered all over. Um, kids were running around, people were kicking soccer balls, and it was weird. I'm like, wait, isn't this like a historical landmark? And there are plenty of playgrounds throughout the city. We saw so many of them, um, and we're like, I just don't understand. I mean, it was a Sunday, you know, I'm sure families, you know, want to do stuff. You know, it'd, it'd be one thing if families were like, hey, let's go to this historical site. Let's learn about the history. Let's talk about it. No, they were just going and hanging out. Um, so, I don't know. That was definitely a different experience than what we've had so far. Yeah, so we've been to, to Chichen Itza, which we felt like some of the experience was... It kind of took away from the experience because there were so many vendors mm -hmm. on the walk there selling things and kind of around the perimeter of the ruins also selling things. So it was like um, historical landmark inside of kind of like a flea market because there was just a bunch of people selling things. And then we went to Tulum and those ruins, obviously it's not one of the seven wonders of the world, but you're on the beach. Um, there was not a lot of people like running around going crazy. And um, there was, yeah, there's nobody sitting on any of the ruins, right? They're, they're blocked off. So you can't even like go up there and physically touch them which is, you know, you, you want to do that, but then you, you got to give, humans needed some sort of limit or some sort of barrier. So I think Tulum was like the most, was the ruins we felt like it was the most like preserved mm -hmm. because there wasn't people selling things on the site. Uh, you had to pay to get in, but it was like up kept very nicely. Mm -hmm. And that was really nice. And then we come here and it's like, yeah, this is, these are 2000 years old. There's all these Roman, like carvings and columns and everything like that and there's like these nice signs up there but yeah it was this it was kind of wild and <laughs> crazy so that was a little bit unfortunate mm -hmm. um so anything else on the ruins mm -hmm. so from the ruins then we went uh about an hour back into the main city and one of the things that uh you see one of the uh, more historic landmarks is the old Rubnica bridge so this is an older style bridge. It looks very Ottoman, right? Yeah. So if you saw our YouTube video on uh, the Messi Bridge in uh, outside of Skodra, you see like the Ottoman style with the big, huge archways and then like the small little archways next to it. But we actually read that it was built under when um, Montenegro was under Roman rule. It was just kind of remodeled and redone to look more uh, in that Ottoman style. And it's over like an old river, which is the Ribnica Bridge. And then that flows right into the um, other bridge that the Millennium Maracha, Br Maracha Bridge mm -hmm. thinks that um, the new Millennium Bridge goes over. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is really cool. Uh, there wasn't that many people there. The water was gorgeous, like a gorgeous blue. Like what yeah, do you think about it's that? Again, yeah, this, the water in this city has definitely been very blue, like the water that we saw under the Messy Bridge. Mm -hmm. Um, very like emerald colors. Yeah, it definitely makes me feel like I want to jump in, although it's winter right now. <laughs> yeah, so it, it was a beautiful spot and the uh, Rimnica Bridge is the oldest bridge in all of uh, Bogorisa. So that was a, a really interesting thing to see. Uh, another thing from history is uh, their version of a man riding a horse statue, which we've seen in Jackson Square. And uh, where else did we see that? So, almost every city we've gone to. Almost every city we've gone to. Uh, <laughs> so. This man on a horse was uh, Nicola. 
and he originally was a prince from 1860 to 1910, and then starting in 1910, he became Montenegro's first and only uh, king. And it was pretty cool. He did a lot of different things. Uh, he introduced Montenegro's first constitution, its freedom of press, and he even established vineyards and set up rules for grape cultivation, which led to um, all of the the wine production that uh, this country has. And you read different things about it. I read one place that like Montenegro has the longest continuous history of making wine. I'm not sure if that's true, not super verified, but I read that. And um, Plantagia, which we'll talk about later for sure, uh, is the largest one-site uh, vineyard in all of Europe. Um, so all of this really came back to King Nicola, and he was in charge. Thanks, uh, King Nicola. Yeah. <laughs> and he was in charge from, like I said, 1910 until the Austria-Hungary Empire, uh, I think it was Empire, came and, and took over um, Montenegro. I think he kind of fled and he claimed that he was king like two years longer, even though he lost power. Um, but yeah, kind of not a great ending, but he did a lot of things for the Montenegrin people, um, like introducing the constitution and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so right next to his statue, there's a really nice park, one of the nice parks that kids should be playing in. Um, and we walked through that, which was lovely. And we also did some more research on this uh, city. So like we said, if you say that Pogaris is a boring place or there's not much to do, well, that's because it's just been through so many things. We don't think that's true. We think there's plenty of things to do. Um, but, you know, it went, it was basically bombed in every single war. So in World War I, uh, between 1914 and 1918, um, Pogorica was like the largest city in the entire kingdom of Montenegro. And then during that time, it was bombed three or four different times, just the city alone. Um, and obviously all of Montenegro was, was under attack during that time and then was occupied by Austria-Hungary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in 1918, it was liberated, became part of the King of, uh, Kingdom of Serbia, which it really didn't fully separate to, I think, 2006. Um, so a long time uh, part of Serbia, but then also it joined Yugoslavia. Um, but, and then in World War II, uh, Pogorica was bombed, I think, over 80 times and killed about, like, 400 citizens. Mm -hmm. And I think 1,700 people from all of Pogorica were, were, like, killed uh, during that entire war. So, I mean, just bombing after bombing, right? So how could there be all these old uh, landmarks? How could there be all of this continuous history when the city's been through so much in its history? So it's really interesting to be able to see what's left of the ruins, what the, that the Ribnica Bridge is still standing, and that was its oldest bridge, to see things like the, the clock tower, tower that's still standing. So uh, they're doing a lot of things to... Um, add new landmarks and I guess to eventually help out with tourism, but just anything that survived all that, like uh, the churches were bombed. So to see that some of the old mosques are still standing is really impressive. If you truly know the history, then you, you know, appreciate just how resilient the city uh, has been and how hard they've worked to build up some of these, these landmarks that were destroyed. Uh, one of the, the landmarks also that's, that survived the World War II bombings was the Sahat Pula uh, clock tower. It was like 19 meters tall, all made out of stone. Uh, what did you think about that? I thought that was a really cool landmark. Yeah, that was, uh, I love the, the stone and the clock tower. You definitely don't, I actually, when we were going to go see it, I really wasn't sure what to expect. Um, but yeah, it's made out of stone, it's really tall, and the contrast of the stone and the blue sky, just, it looked really cool in the pictures that we took, for sure. Yeah, and the man responsible for, who, who's given credit for, you know, building the clock tower, um, and at least one of the mosques there is Mehmet Pasha Osmanagic, and um, he's got a uh, the Osman Magic Osmanagic um, mosque that is right there. It was also affected in the war too, but they did a lot of renovations over the time, and he's actually buried. Like, there's a huge tomb. The courtyard is not very big in front of the mosque, but like most of the uh, uh, courtyard is really taken up by by his tomb and it's got like some big arches, arches over it. Um, so it's pretty interesting there. Uh, you wanna talk about our experience there as I was walking around doing some filming? Yeah, we were, you know, 
obviously we will always want to be respectful of the different religions and stuff. And so as a woman, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to have like my head covered, even we weren't going inside the mosque, but even just on the outside in the courtyard area. And so I forgot my cloth fabric back at the, um, at the room. And so we're like, Hey, you know, you just go kind of film, you know, in the courtyard area, I'll stand outside here and I'll just wait for you. Um, and I could have sworn it felt like an hour went by, I'm exaggerating, uh, probably like a good 20 minutes went by and I'm like, where in the world is my husband? I got so nervous. I mean, part of me is like, he probably got invited into the mosque because when we first got there, they had the call of worship. And so some guys were heading into the mosque to do their prayer. And so my one part of me is like, no, 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 he just got, you know, he's probably invited into the mosque and he's experiencing that. That's totally fine. But then the other part of me, I'm like, well, what if he's in trouble? What if he wasn't allowed to be there? And what if like, I like started circling the mosque, trying to like peek in to see what was going on. And uh, finally he came out and you could tell he was excited that he was in the mosque. And I had this like face of fear and worry. Yeah. <laughs> so I was outside, you know, doing some video, just kind of, you know, checking out the, the grounds, if you will. Um, and one of the gentlemen just like, Hey, you want to come inside? And I'm like, sure. But I mean, I gotta go tell my wife that I'm going to go inside. He's like, no, you just gotta take off your shoes. Like, yeah, but I gotta just gotta tell her right over there. He's like, no, you take your shoes off inside. So it's like, kind of just got swept away. But it was like, so nice for them to like invite mm -hmm. us in. And like, this is, um, a very old mosque. So to be able to see the inside and, and, um, you know, kind of experience one of the call to prayers. I've never, uh, done that before. Um, I've done like a, a Ramadan kind of thing, like a, a fasting to experience that, but I didn't go to the mosque at night to, you know, celebrate with everybody. So to see that experience live was was quite impressive. So I wanted to be able to tell you, but it kind of just all happened so fast. <laughs> it's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that was really uh, quite interesting. Uh, I enjoyed being able to see that. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that was really interesting was, like I said, uh, there's aircraft hangar which is basically a mountain. I don't really know if it is actually a mountain and they dug into it, which makes the most sense to me. Uh, but it's this huge mountain looking thing. And it was a um, aircraft hangar for Yugoslavia. In it was damaged in 1999 during the NATO bombings uh, on the city. And during that time, oh, from 1999 till 2005, uh, it was completely uh, left empty. Um, after that, I think around 2006, like the next year, um, the major winery in that town, uh, Plantaja, which is the winery in the vineyards, that is the biggest vineyard, one site vineyard in all of Europe, um, took over the old aircraft hangar and made it into the Sipchanic, um winery. So it was a, a Yugoslav era aircraft hangar, which had about 28 airplanes that it fit in. This place is huge. It definitely yeah. feels like it. And now it is a winery. So I made an appointment with the person who was going to give us a wine tour via email. We emailed back and forth. Um, but when we got there, that lady wasn't there. And it's, someone else came out and said it was going to be like 10 or 15 minutes. This place is really cool because it has like a waterfall coming on the out. Um, on the outside area there, down the mountain. Like in the entrance, yeah. Yeah, and eventually the lady showed up, which she acted like we've never talked before, but <laughs> I know it was like the same name as the person who I've been emailing with, so that was funny. But she did a great job. We got a tour of the uh, winery, and we got to see uh, like all the barrels. We saw that there were some barrels from like Bordeaux, you know, which is a very big wine producer in, the, in France. Mm -hmm. uh, we got to see their metal containers that they use for the white wine. Mm -hmm. uh, and then all the majority of it, though, was these these uh, oak barrels yeah. for the red wine. So, yeah. I mean, what did you think about just, like, kind of touring around that, the general area? Yeah, so this was my first experience going to a winery. And uh, while I understand there's, like, you know, vineyards on the outside, it's cool to see, like, the, you know, the other process of this. Like, once you get the grapes... Um, and just seeing all these barrels and there's, you know, different sizes and she was telling us and explaining us what kind of barrels and how much each barrel held and how long that, um, you know, depending on the wine, there's, you know, X number of years that they have to stay in the barrel. Um, and the difference between 
you know, the red wine in the barrels and then the white wine in the Enox, which is the silver container. And there was even one wine that we tried that was a red wine, but it started in the Enox and then they moved it over into a barrel. Um, and yeah, it was just a really cool experience. So we walked around that. Um, she had this huge, like, kind of map, uh, you know, like a, like yeah. a 3D map kind of thing. Right. It's like if you go to an amusement park or you see the, you know, construction plans like they make a little model of it. Oh, it's like yes. a model of all of Pogrisa and you get to see yeah the mountains on the outside and then the fields and the vineyards in the center. Yeah and you could see that the 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 land of the vineyards is like two to three times bigger than the city where all the you know the buildings are of Pogorisa. So that was really cool and she was showing like you know because of the placement you know we can pretty much produce you know grow grapes most of the year, um, you know, between the mountains and this and that. And so she was explaining all that. And that was really cool to um, just, just learn that for sure. Yeah. And normally we uh, drink wine, apparently like savage. <laughs> so she, I mean, like, what's the real way to drink this, right? So she was able to show us okay. how you hold the wine glass and you hold it up against like a white background. You'll, at least in the white wine, you'll be able to see uh, like the colors in it and like how to smell it. Uh, and smell like what fruits in it and all this kind of stuff you do before you even take a sip of it mm -hmm. um, and it was cool because I think for like 17 euros each we're able to get that tour mm -hmm. um, we had five wines uh, so two whites and three reds mm -hmm. um, and then there was cheese that paired with it so there was like some um, cheap cheese or yeah Goat cheese, Goat cheese and cow cheese. And then cow cheese yeah. and then some bread and then some of their own olive oil that they oh, yeah. use as well. Um, so yeah, it was only supposed to be, I think, an hour tour. And like the, the cheapest one, most affordable one would have been, I think, 12 euros, but then you wouldn't get anything to pair it with. Uh, so for 17 euros, it's supposed to be an hour, but we were the only ones there. And I think, uh, you know, we all hit it off really, really good, had a good conversation. So it wound up being like two hours, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a really great time. Yeah, she was awesome. Um, and we, you know, enjoyed our time with her and enjoyed the, with our time at the winery. Um, definitely learned a lot. Um, I, you know, I've always admired people that like can smell the notes, uh, you know, smell what's in the wine or taste it. And I was starting to, to feel like I, you know, I was learning. So hopefully down the road after we visit a bunch of countries and try everybody's wine, we'll get better at that. Um, but it was it was a really cool experience for sure. Yeah, highly recommend you take a wine tour wherever you are. And if you happen to be at Total Wine or anything and you see some uh, Montenegrin wine, definitely pick up some. It's, it's very affordable and it's actually really, really good. Yeah, it's definitely really good. We liked it a lot. Yeah. So the winery was uh, probably the most fun that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, in all of Pogorisa, so that was a, an amazing experience. Was it, it because we drank five glasses of wine? <laughs> it might have, been, might have been. Uh, But yeah, so that, that was all really cool. It blended, you know, history, with food, with drink, uh, with meeting new people. Mm -hmm. It was a perfect combination of what you want to experience when you're in a new country. And, um, you know, I think that between like this winery and some of their other wineries that they have, um, you know, that Pogarisa could be a place that really a lot of people will go to. Um, we saw like all the work that the Albanians were doing in their country, especially Tirana, building like hotels and, and redoing the streets and stuff like that. But if you do come to that area or anywhere in the Balkans, um, definitely make sure that you stop by uh, Montenegro. Um, so it had, the city has been through a lot and the people are super resilient. And um, so a lot of the really interesting landmarks are uh, quite new. So one of the, the newer ones is the uh, the Millennium Bridge. So this is like a counterbalance core uh, cable bridge. I think like the, the Skyway Bridge in Tampa is like this, uh, where you there's these huge cords. So it looks awesome from the sides and also looks awesome as you're kind of going underneath it. It really hurts your eyes while you're looking yeah. up as you're walking under it. And there's uh, little benches where you can sit and have a picnic. Um, but there's also, I think, I think there's like a total of like four bridges that are parallel over the Maracha River. You have the Millennium Bridge. There's another bridge where mostly for cars, the Millennium and that one. And then there's two um, bridges where just like pedestrian path bridges. Mm -hmm. So uh, we walked under the Millennium Bridge and we walked on one of the pedestrian path bridges, which has its own little kind of amphitheater 
uh, set up right there on, on, on the river. Mm -hmm. And it, it's quite an interesting uh, walk where you don't have to worry about like cars or anything like mm -hmm. that. Uh, to do that. So what were your thoughts on the uh, Millennium Bridge? Yeah, it's um, the architecture is really cool. Um, I would have thought it would have been a little bit maybe longer, but the river's not that long. So obviously you don't need a bridge that long if the river's not that long. Um, but yeah, it's definitely really cool. We got some really cool drone shots from that. And on one side of the bridge, kind of like we took a little path to kind of go under it almost, not into the water, but there ended up being a whole bunch of people. Um, this was a Sunday as well, I think. Yeah. So on a Sunday, people, you know, probably just going out, um, and just soaking up the, the nice weather. Cause the weather has been actually wonderful here. It's been like in the sixties, um, and we're here in, in February. And so people were kind of sitting outside with a coffee and a blanket and, you know, with their spouse or their, you know, loved ones and just enjoying um, nature. And I believe the big park, the Gorka Park, is to the other side of it because we saw a lot of green, you know, big trees. And so later on, we kind of walked over to that area a little bit further down. But I think that's like a big park over there as well. Um, yeah, definitely beautiful sites for sure. Yeah, uh, the Gorka Park has uh, an adventure uh, trail for adults and for kids. There was a lot of people there, you know, big path to walk around. Uh, there are, you know, some statues and all kinds of different places to just hang out and have some peace um, kind of away from, from the city. So that's another cool place that you can you can check out if you're in Pogorisa. And um, yeah, so that's the park's good. And yeah, the Millennium Bridge is this big, beautiful bridge. Obviously, like you said, the, the river itself is not that big, but um, really cool architecture there with the counterbalance and it was only open in two to like july 2005 for montenegro's national day uh, another major monument there is was also quite new and it was open in 2013 and i believe they broke ground in like 1993 and that is the cathedral of the resurrection of christ which you wouldn't think this huge beautiful church would be kind of where it is it's kind of just feel like it's kind of just in a neighborhood, right? Yeah, it's just, it's like at the end of a road heading into a neighborhood. Um, and uh, just a lot of like parking, like spaces near it. And yeah, it, it was an odd placement, but um, it was beautiful. Yeah, beautiful on the outside and the inside. Yeah. And um, so we were able to go inside, check that out as well. It had all the beautiful, I don't know what the right term is, but it's paintings like on the inside with, uh, I would have, you know, all these different scenes from, from the Bible mm -hmm. and uh, really uh, beautiful church. Um, you know, whether you're walking around and see the paintings or from the outside, it's like white and then it has like mm -hmm. these big gold crosses, which is cool if you check it out during the day, because as you're walking around it, you see the reflecting light yeah. from the sun. Uh, and then there was, the moon was actually out during yeah, the day too. Yeah, the moon, and so I was peeking in between the, you know, the crosses. It looked really, really cool, so. Yeah, it was a, a good sight to see. It was off of a kind of a main road, but like I said, towards the end and on the opposite end of that road was kind of a little hustle and bustle area. That's where we actually stopped and got some lunch at, at one point. And there was a Ferris wheel in that area. Yeah, we, we watched a lot of videos and saw a lot of pictures. We didn't see any Ferris wheels. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, it was like a, it was like a big pie. Right, so yeah. it wasn't like a small little thing. It was like the Pogarisa eye, if you will. Yeah. Um, so we're able to see that, and we stopped and got some lunch, where we got some coffees and also um, got some Italian food. We didn't have any traditional Montenegrin food, unfortunately, but uh, this Italian food is really good. Yeah, we um, this uh, this week we had to spend a little bit more based on you know taxi and that kind of stuff. So we cooked a lot at home, um, but that day we were out. A bunch so we needed to stop and get food and we did realize that there were a lot more restaurants here in Podgorica than there were in Albania but most of these restaurants right now are just takeout and um and so we did find one that was takeout and you can never go wrong with Italian and so I got a smoked sandwich um smoked salmon sandwich and you got a risotto vegetable risotto and so we took that away sat um on a bench nearby and they actually gave us some bread like as appetizers as well and it was absolutely delicious yeah really good and like you said the, the weather's been great so even though we could eat inside uh eating outside the park with the ferris wheel and the, and the beautiful weather 
uh, wasn't bad at all. So we really enjoyed, the, really probably the main time that we've actually eaten out. So yeah. that was good. Uh, another thing that we did some research and saw some pictures on, uh, unlike the Ferris wheel, which is a surprise, <laughs> was what they call the Niagara Falls of Montenegro. So in these pictures, uh, they look... <laughs> It looked like it was almost like a real you know the Niagara Falls on the uh, American Canadian border, but in real life it was uh, not really the same. It was one of those like Instagram pictures to reality kind of situations. Yeah. And we, it was close to the Sipchantic, uh winery, so we did walk over there afterwards. But what did you think about the falls in real life? Yeah. So photography plays a big role in uh in what you see right and so it looks like a lot of the photos that people have taken they're down right in front of the rushing water and we because we were on the side of the vineyard um we saw it kind of like a little bit higher a little bit aerial view and so it's not as tall as you know definitely not as tall as the one um in the U u.s canada border but um you know but it's a landmark and it's it was beautiful and the water there was also very emerald and green and there's a restaurant i think right you know right near it you probably go eat at as well it looked like um, i had good fish and chips there so if you do want to go mm -hmm. uh right down by the the waterfall you get a good view mm -hmm. uh food is probably delicious like there's tons of people not just there at the falls but also mm -hmm. at the restaurant so the food must have been really good yeah. too just don't ex expect it to be like this huge grandiose waterfall mm -hmm. like you see in other places yeah. But, you know, I'm glad that we checked it out because it was something that we did research on and wanted to see everything with our own eyes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, was didn't leave, live up to the hype of what we thought it was going to be. But, you know, always good to see uh, a waterfall. And we were in the general area anyway, so it all worked out. Um, as far as just general transportation, we did uh, taxis more than uh, we've done before. Mm -hmm. From basically the, the city area to... Uh, Subchanic Winery, I think it was seven euros total, and then from uh, the that area we walked to um, the yeah. Main road. So then yeah, so then we went to Subchantic, and then we walked over um, by the largest uh, vineyards in uh, Europe to the uh, Niagara Falls, and then we walked to the main road and went to a bus stop. Bus didn't show up. I don't know. Maybe we'll never ride the bus again. Uh, but we did, were able to flag down a cab, which uh, took us back uh, closer to where we needed to be. And um, that was like on the meter system. So it was only three uh, euros to, to get back to there. And so $10 in taxis total, which is definitely not bad. And that saved us like, what, two hours total or maybe three hours of walking. Of, of walking. So well worth the 10 euros for the day. Um, and that was, you know, our time in uh, Pod Carissa. So we had a really interesting time. Uh, any final thoughts on the, the city? Yeah, unfortunately, we didn't like, uh, you know, meet too many people other than the lady at the winery. And so, you know, it's hard to kind of talk to, talk about the people in, in the city. Um, everybody seemed, you know, friendly. Our host here has been awesome, super helpful in helping us navigate some stuff and looking for certain areas and giving us recommendations on places to eat. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's kind of, I mean, it's been a good experience. We've seen a lot and we walked a lot this week for sure. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So our next location will be in a new country. So have to stay tuned to see where we're going to go next. And new episodes are out each week on YouTube, Apple, and Spotify for our podcast. And then obviously the blog is a visual thing. So it's just out each week, one or two episodes on YouTube. And keep up with our daily content on Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. This is Weedy Travels. What, what could possibly, possibly be next? next?